Hello, everyone. Um, we would like to welcome you to, to this session um, today, um, focusing on a mobile for humanitarian innovation program and specific key role that uh, humanitarian con connectivity charter has enabled all of us to play, especially when there are disasters. But before I go there, um, I'd like to remind you all that we have lined up for you a brilliant panel today that we'll be going through. But before the panel discussion starts, uh, my colleague Zoe and Belinda will be taking us through a very short um, presentation, talk about the work and the partnership that we've observed um, taken by humanitarian agency and the mobile network operator in during crisis. Let's start by introducing you to the Humanitarian Connectivity Charter, which was launched in March 2015. The charter was commissioned by GSMA and um, specifically looking at how the private sector, mainly mobile network operator and the humanitarian organization can partner together uh, during time of crisis. The charter has several principles, um, among them, is to enhance co coordination within and among mobile network operators before and during disaster, to scale and standardize preparedness and response activities across the industry to enable more predictable uh, response. And the third one is uh, to strengthen partnership between mobile industry, government, and the humanitarian sector. Some of what we've come to witness, especially now during um, um, the COVID. Um, the responses of COVID crisis. The ultimate aim of uh, the charter is to strengthen access to communication and information for those affected by crisis in order to reduce the loss of life and positively contribute to humanitarian responses. Now, I don't need to get to go through that in more details because in your day-to-day -day work, I'm very sure you've come to work with humanitarian agency, partnering with them, uh, with their responses, and I will get to hear all of those during um, the, the panel discussion. As I said earlier, the, the Humanitarian Connectivity Charter was launched by GSMA Mobile for Humanitarian Innovation. Now, Mobile for Humanitarian Innovation is one of the programs within GSMA, which um, has as a core principle or vision to strengthen again partnership, to build partnership between the humanitarian organization and the mobile um, network operator, as well as those who are within the mobile ecosystem itself. How do we do that? We do that through advocacy, we do that through research and insight, and we do that through catalyzing and building scalable er, uh, partnerships between um, uh, the private sector and the humanitarian sector. The mobile humanitarian for innovation has uh, five key thematic areas that we focus on, um, and these are um, mobile enabled utilities, um, food and climate resilience, digital identity, gender inclusivity, and mobile financial services. Uh, to date, the, we have quite an ambitious target of targeting um, to reach up, up to 7 million people um, by March 2022. One thing I forgot or I needed to mention earlier on, um, they, uh, under Humanitarian Connectivity Charter, we have to date 155 mobile networks that have been signed to the Humanitarian Connectivity Charter. And we need to say our colleagues and friends and members from uh, mobile industry today with us on this panel are all working for the mobile the mobile network operators that are the signatories of uh, the chat itself. Uh, now we're going to be moving forward to um, a brief presentation by my colleague Zoe and Belinda. We'll start with Belinda and Belinda when you come on please just do a brief introduction of yourself, what you do and a good directly to the presentation. Thank you. And my name is Belinda Bazaar. I work as an insights manager in the M4H team. I'm going to, as Isaac just mentioned, I'm going to give a short presentation around the partnership during crisis report. So I'm just going to share my screen.
hope everyone can see that okay. So, as Isaac mentioned, um, I'll be going through the highlights of one of M4H's recently published reports, um, Partnering During Crisis, the shared value par of partnerships between mobile network operators and humanitarian organisations. Um, I'll start by giving an overview of the report objectives and approach and how this particular piece of research came about. I'll then give a high level overview of the key insights of the report, which will hopefully provide a solid framework around the importance of robust partnerships between mobile network operators, so MNOs and humanitarian organisations, and how best to leverage each stakeholder's core competencies. So to start, I'll give a bit of a background to the report. Last year, we published a report with the IRC, navigating the shift to, to digital humanitarian assistance, which focused on IRC's journey to digitising cash and voucher assistance programmes, so CBA programme. And a key theme throughout that piece of research highlighted the need to see MNOs as partners and move away from the supplier client relationship that we often see. The partnering during crisis report is complementary to the IRC report and provides the MO perspective of engagement with humanitarian organisations and digs into what is needed to create successful and impactful partnerships. So to inform this report, we conducted in-depth case studies with four mobile network operators, with the four mobile network operators highlighted. So Zain Cash Iraq, Vodacom Mozambique, Jazz Cash Pakistan, and Paltel Group Jawal Palestine um, between October 2019 and January 2020. Um, all of these case studies were conducted face to face, except for the Zain Cash Iraq um, case study, which was conducted remotely. And each consisted of desk reviews and in-depth interviews with key people across each organisation. So from the de from departments in terms of like the commercial unit, strategy, finance, corporate social responsibility, the foundation and senior leadership. And in total, around 30 interviews were con conducted. Um, we also validated the content of the report through workshops with the wider GSMA and Bridge team and other conversations with mobile network operators as well. So for each case study, we firstly looked at the different operating models adopted by each mobile network operator in response to each of their respective humanitarian situations. So whether a response was CSR driven or revenue driven, for example, or in most cases, um, an amalgamation of various operating models. Um, secondly, we examined each MNO's key reasons for engagement, which included a mix of the need for revenue generating activities, um, as well as um, business continuity um, reasons. And a consistent reason across all four case studies was the desire to help the communities that they are part of. Um, finally, we dug into the success factors um, that enable these MNOs to find sustainable, sustainable solutions to do just that and help those in need. Now to dig into the key insights. Over the past several years, there has been a shift in the humanitarian sector and it is now generally accepted that mobile technology can provide a lifeline to populations affected by disaster and facilitate um, more dignified and self-reliant approaches to the provision of humanitarian assistance when used appropriately. Um, there has also been increased recognition among donors and humanitarian organisations that mobile technology and MNOs have an important role to play in delivering dignified aid. During humanitarian crises, MNOs work hard to ensure network continuity to support access to communication and for affected populations with access to a mobile phone, this can be a critical lifeline. So we wanted this research to provide evidence that helps MNOs make informed decisions about engaging in partnerships with humanitarian organisations and to help humanitarian actors better understand their MNO partners and build successful long term partnerships. As the visual shows, we wanted to highlight the unique core competencies and expertise of MNOs and humanitarian organisations and to emphasise that in proper combination, these expertise can improve the coordination, effectiveness and outcomes of joint response and recovery efforts. As an example and highlighted by the, the arrows on this slide, for mobile network operators, these include technical expertise, regulatory understanding and data and consumer insights. While for humanitarians, it includes understanding the landscape of need, as well as having protection expertise and trusted relationship with those affected by crises. Appropriately combining these respective expertise will result in a more nuanced understanding of how and for what purpose mobile technology can be used 
in each context, as well as ensuring programmes, so any programmes that are introduced, do not exacerbate existing inequalities. So through our research, we identified three areas where partnerships can help improve the delivery and effectiveness of humanitarian assistance. So the example I just gave in the previous slide highlights how expertise of MNOs and humanitarians can enable context specific digital interventions that meet the needs of everyone in an affected community and would fall under two of the areas highlighted in this slide, um, country, crisis and context and user understanding. Um, to give an example around um, the final area identified, um, reach and scale, um, MNOs have extensive and robust infrastructure systems, distribution networks, um, including agent networks, and often long-term relationships with customers who can also be recipients of humanitarian assistance. Meanwhile, humanitarian organisations have strong community ties, the trust of end users and field staff who are engaged with communities. So when these strengths are combined, partners can support service delivery to not only those affected in urban and easier to reach settings, but those in need in remote, harder to reach or geographically dispersed areas as well. Um, our research also highlighted that MNOs and humanitarian organisations often share a user base and common, objective, and common objectives, and that partnership with a well-designed solution can present a win-win-win scenario. So for users, mobile network operators and humanitarian organisations alike. Um, from our interviews and wider engagements, um, several common features of successful partnerships emerged. Um, the four areas identified for both partners essentially boil down to ensuring ample time is given to allow all involved to be on the same page in terms of what is required and what can be realistically expected from the partnerships. For MNOs, it's about recognising what can be delivered realistically. For example, if a CVA programme in a very hard to reach location requires a higher level of resources, both financial and otherwise, this should be made clear in any proposal. We also found that MNOs that had specific structures in place to support such partnerships were the most successful, as their understanding of the needs and requirements of partner organisations was higher. Um, and this links to the advice to humanitarian organisations to share the bigger picture. If MNOs know how what they are being asked to do fits into the wider humanitarian programmatic objective, they are better placed to not only provide the specific service the humanitarian organisation is seeking, but also consider if there are other services they could provide alongside it. And for both, there is a need to understand each other's operating models. MNOs need to recognise the requirements of humanitarian organisations especially the requirements to do no harm and, and avoid programmes that introduce or exacerbate existing inequalities, which the use of technology can do if introduced incorrectly. Likewise, humanitarians need to understand the local digital ecosystem to be best placed to use the most relevant digital interventions, as well as to recognise the need for sustainable business models for mobile network operators to be able to sustain providing quality services to the sector, though this does not apply in the case of a rapid onset crisis, for example, where getting help to those in need of immediate, immediate assistance takes precedence over everything else, as was the case in um, Vodacom Mozambique in its response to Cyclone Adai. So for those seeking out a partnership with an MNO, these four values are a useful way of framing how best to engage them. For any partnership to succeed, there must be a clear motivation to participate. For an MNO, these four values and the questions that need to be answered to assess them help in understanding whether a partnership is feasible. The nature of any proposed engagement will determine the weight given to each value. Oh, and this, and, and, but the, this would likely be an amalgamation of these that determine the actual value proposition to the mobile network operator. As I mentioned earlier, MNOs and humanitarians often share a user base and common obje objectives, and partnerships with a well-designed solution can present a win-win-win scenario for the recipients of assistance, mobile network operators and humanitarian organisations alike. 
As the landscape of humanitarian response continues to change, both in response to shifts in the nature of crises and funding patterns, it is clear that the humanitarian sector will increasingly rely on MNOs and the wider private sector to help deliver impactful services for recipients. And we hope that the insights from this report can go some way in helping to cultivate successful partnerships and consequently help in achieving this goal. And to just quickly wrap up, to dig deeper, please do read the full report, which includes a dedicated case study for each MNO interviewed, providing a background to their involvement in the humanitarian sector and how they responded to humanitarian crisis in their respective contexts. Um, the reports also include an executive, executive summary and each case study translated into their respective languages and, and published as standalone reports. Thanks for listening. Um, I'll hand it back over to Isaac now. Great. Thank, thank you very much for this presentation, Belinda. Um, I'm going to be now passing over to my colleague uh, Zoe, who's going to be making a short presentation for us on the building the resilient industry. Um, Zoe, over to you. Please start by introducing yourself, your role, and what you do. Uh, over to uh, you. Great. Thanks so much, Isaac. Um, I am Zoe Hamilton. I'm also an insights manager with uh, Belinda. And today I am going to be sharing uh, about a report that we wrote around specifically the HCC, which is the Humanitarian Connectivity Charter. Uh, that Isaac introduced at the beginning of this session. So uh, in the fall of this year, we published a report called Building a Resilient Industry, How MNOs Prepare for and Respond to Natural Disasters. So unlike the previous report that Belinda was just presenting, this report focuses specifically on natural disasters and draws from the lessons that MNOs have learned through engaging with the Humanitarian Connectivity Charter and responding to uh, humanitarian crises uh, over over the past years. Um, so this guide is a, is a web based resource that highlights the efforts from across the mobile industry uh, in how mobile network operators both prepare for and respond to sudden onset natural disasters. It highlights potential risks, considerations and lessons from their experiences. And we really tried to make something that was quite practical. Um, the audience is MNOs that are located in high risk areas for natural disasters um, who are thinking through the processes that they want to put in place to better prepare for and respond to to natural disasters. And you'll notice that a few times I've mentioned natural disasters, but we really believe that this guide can be useful beyond that scope. We've noticed with the COVID-19 crisis that a lot of these lessons that are in this guide are applicable as well. Um, so the, the guide was created using examples from 20 different MNOs uh, around the world. So from Latin America, North America, Africa, Asia, and Europe. Uh, we conducted eight phone interviews with Axiata Group, Smart Philippines, Globe Philippines, Telefonica Group, Turkcell, Zane Group, Jawal, and Korea Telecom. And then we did two country visits for more in-depth case studies. So these were in, to Japan to interview Docomo and KDDI and to Jamaica to interview Digicel. So these two case studies really provided us an in-depth look, a 360 view of how these three MNOs created their disaster preparedness plan. There are three that are really at the cutting edge for how to do this. Um, so at the end of the report, we go through both of these case studies and look at every aspect of their disaster preparedness protocols. Uh, we also had a validation workshop in Jakarta where we had 27 participants from both the humanitarian sector uh, and the mobile network sector to, to contribute and, and add in their, their thoughts. So to give you an overview of the structure of this report, as I said, it's an interactive web-based report, which means uh, that you can click on any one of these sections and it'll take you directly to that specific content because we realized that each of these sections of a business will, will sit in different departments. So different parts will be relevant to different people. Um, but the first, we had three main sections with these subsections within. So the first area was internal impact that really looks at what MNOs can do 
internally to make their core operations more resilient. So this internal chapter includes seven subsections. The first looks at business continuity management and overall how MNOs can create structures to analyze risks and, and ensure the continuity of services. So that's really like the, the policy. Um, second, the disaster management teams uh, that are individuals or team responsibility and, and how you train those key contacts to prepare during a disaster. The third was staff safety and well-being, which looks a little beyond that to all of the staff and how are you going to make sure that they are taken care of during a disaster. The fourth was access and transport, um, which is coming up with plans to ensure that key sites uh, are accessible during a disaster. So what are your plans for reaching those hard to reach cell towers and, and ensuring connectivity that can be so vital? Uh, fifth, infrastructure, so building resilience into the physical infrastructure, the towers, things like that, which is related to six, which is the core network and equipment, um, and seven, power systems. Power is often the thing during a disaster that ends up being that weak link. Um, so all of those seven are internal impact, and as I said, each of these seven sections will have risks that MNOs should take into account considerations of how they could be more resilient and lessons learned. So examples from real MNOs for how, how they've addressed these different business areas. Now, the next chapter is direct external impact. And these are operations that are outside of the MNO, but have a direct impact on the MNO's ability to operate during a disaster. So that will be supporting customers, suppliers and supply chain and working with policymakers. So again, there's considerations in each of those sections and lessons learned. And the third main section is indirect external impact. So these are ways that MNOs can go above and beyond um, to support the response, which is really at this, the heart of the spirit of the HCC of looking at how important connectivity is in a time of crisis. I mean, we've all realized that with, with COVID in our own homes recently, right? Like if you have cell connection, it, it allows you to interact with the world and especially during a time of natural disaster, that's the most important thing is being able to contact a responder, being able to contact loved ones. So this chapter looks into how MNOs can work with responders, how they can work with other MNOs in the ecosystem and how they can provide additional humanitarian support. Um, so finally, I just uh, wanted to show this. This is how the, the resource is laid out online so you can see you can click through the, the chapters at the top and then the subsections on that second light blue bar to really go directly into the section that's most relevant to your team. Um, and this is an example from business continuity management. So you can see the introduction and risks on the left, the key considerations that an MNO might want to take into account when planning for resilience um, and then ending with MNO examples. So we have a variety of examples from around the world for how different MNOs in different contexts have dealt with these risks. Um, so just to give you a, a flavor of the sort of information that's included in there, um, Digicel in, in the Caribbean, uh, they have a year round crisis team that includes technical operations, HR communications, supply chain and customer service team. So they've identified these key teams that need to be accessible during a crisis. Um, and they have simulations in one to two of their markets annually um, to really make sure that all of these people are, are prepared, are familiar with the protocols and are ready for when a disaster strikes. Um, in terms of, of staff well-being, they have HR policies that allow uh, that provide staff with additional support, um, allow people to work from home, that sort of thing. Uh, they also have cell on wheels ready to go, pre-positioned in strategic locations. So if any cell towers go down right away, they can get restore network coverage in those areas. Uh, the physical tower structures are reinforced so they can withstand category four to five winds. Um, and they've reinforced the network equipment. Um, and, and if a strong storm is forecasted, they actually move this network equipment um, so that it's safe. Uh, they also have refueling plans. That's to ensure that the, the generators have enough power to, to keep going. Um, and they work closely with the government to send out preparedness information and early warning alerts um, to citizens 
which is obviously a, a key role that MNOs can play in, in disaster preparedness and response. Uh, so this resource is, is available online. It, it really captures a lot of the learnings that MNOs have gained from around the world. Um, and we, we want this to be a very practical guide to, to help MNOs in, in other markets. So I'm going to uh, hand back to, to Isaac now to get us started on, on the panel discussion. Thank you, Zoe. Um, I may initially I made a classic mistake of forgetting to introduce myself when we started the session, um, which I'm going to do now before we start the panel. My name is Isaac Kwani. I work for GSMA Mobile for Humanitarian Innovation as Senior Manager for Strategic Partnerships and uh, Marketing Engineers. Today, we have an exciting panelist with vast experience covering both mobile network um, industry as well as um, the humanitarian sector. Uh, we are very fortunate to be joined by Mr. Rudy Gitobu, who leads Mobile Money as head of Mobile Money for Econet Leo in Burundi. We have Mr. Jafet Ariko, who is Senior Vice President for Airtel Money Group. And we have Mr. Ivan Twali, who is the country director for Give Directly Rwanda. They will get to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about the work and the work of the organization. So this goes directly to the first question. Gentlemen, can you a, tell us a little bit about you, your background, about your work within both the humanitarian sector and the MNO? So I'm going to start with um, with Toby. If you could tell us a little bit about you, your work, and what, um, how um, your organization or uh, connect uh, work with the humanitarian sector. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kwame. Uh, I hope I'm audible to your side, confirm. Thank you. So I don't know if it's by by design or coincidence, apparently today is a humanitarian day, I'm reminded. So I think this discussion could not come at a better day or a better time for that matter. So thank you very much. So uh, my name, like you've said before, is Wood Gitobu. I'm currently the general manager at uh, Cassava Fintech Burundi, uh, which is an affiliate company under Econet Wireless Group. Uh, basically, uh, a fintech business that is integrated uh, and of course uh, running mobile money uh, and of course uh, part of that of what we do on a daily basis or uh, when call time calls for us to is uh, acting on the humanitarian space uh, we've been doing that quite for quite some time uh, we have quite a number of partners uh, within the, uh, the humanitarian uh, space uh, we've had engagements, uh, you know, tripartite uh, um, uh, uh, agreements with the government and the humanitarian players, and of course ourselves, uh, in trying to resolve uh, uh, quite a number of areas of humanitarian need within Burundi. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it comes as a, as a, you know, a key area for focus as a business uh, because it's very strategically aligned to our vision as a company. Um, where we envision a socially and financially inclusive future uh, that we say leaves no African behind. So I think this call in itself is very much aligned uh, within our um, embodiment as a company uh, within Africa. So in a nutshell, that is what I do. And I think uh, I'm very much excited again to be part of this panel. Many thanks. Uh, I'm going to pass to now Jafet, please, if you could a, tell us a little bit about you and uh, give a, a snapshot of the background of your work within the humanitarian sector. Over to you, Jafet. Sorry, Jafet, you, you've done a classic mistake again of forgetting to unmute yourself. Just a Thank you. Sorry. Sorry for that. Um, thank you, Isaac. 
uh, this is a, actually a good opportunity for us to, to, to share, as um, my colleague and, and friend uh, Ud has uh, mentioned, today is a very important day in our lives. And I will, uh, as we go into the discussions, we will be also sharing why we think uh, we live actually to solve some of the challenges or some of the gaps that we found we find uh, uh, existing in the humanitarian, whereby we become the last mile uh, source. Just by, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Jafet Arito. I look after um, Airtel Money across the 14 operations, um, where I look at uh, three main areas. Uh, the first area being um, the operations, uh, and the second area being the controls and compliance. These are the three focus areas that uh, we can do. Uh, in terms of our interaction with our humanitarian, we look at it from actually uh, two different angles. For me specifically, where I see a lot of um, connection uh, with humanitarian is on, first of all, providing platform for information sharing so that you can be able to reach out to the, to the, to the, to the, to the needy and uh, the beneficiaries uh, on this uh, space. And the second one is actually what we would call uh, cash um, disbursement or um, in, in, in many ways, because most of these people that we are interacting with are mostly the less fortunate in the society, who needs a lot of support. And uh, there is no other platform that I can see that can be able to reach. And there's one thing that connects us actually to the humanitarian uh, society. Where I see that uh, connection is because we all of us focus on the same customer. Because if, you, if I look at the humanitarian, they are looking at reaching out to these people who are financially excluded before, people who do not have financial capacity to manage crisis. And this is actually our focus area because our objective in today's world and what, what, what we wake up to do every morning as an organization is to make sure that we get everybody connected. First of all, for communication, because com communication becomes a critical uh, element during a crisis. And the second one, actually, to make sure that we can reach them should we want to advance to, to send some uh, financial support. And this is actually in a national world. I, 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 as, a, as a member of the team, Airtel believes actually in, um, in uh, partnerships. And uh, I, can, I, I can give examples across the 14 operations. We have worked very closely with every uh, humanitarian organization to make sure that uh, first of all we we, we engage the the, the the beneficiaries and uh, on the second uh, and, and also we educate the beneficiaries we, we we will share maybe as we go through the panel discussion uh, some of the things that we have done that are unique in every market but for now I want just to make it uh, that short but I'm very excited to be part of this panel today thank you Isaac. wonderful thank you Jeff and uh, last but not least Ivan Bit, tell us a little bit about you and uh, your organization background or your work in the humanitarian sector, knowing that you represent the sector as well. Over to you, um, Thank you, Isaac. I'm, uh, I'm very excited to be part of this panel. Uh, and what uh, a great time to have these conversations, especially on one World Humanitarian Day. Um, my name is Ivan. Twally, and I'm the country director uh, of Give Directly. Uh, my perspective uh, spans across both the humanitarian and the commercial, where my background was before I, I transitioned uh, to the humanitarian uh, side of things. Um, just to give you <clears throat> to expand a bit more on that, um, I was in petroleum for a long time before moving to Telco, and I was part of the core team that set up Airtel Money in Rwanda. Uh, so after 13 years of doing the commercial bit, um, I felt I could leverage that experience uh, to make a different kind of impact uh, in the humanitarian side, and that's why I joined Give Directly. Um, at Give Directly, uh, our mission is very simple. Um, we basically facilitate donors to send money to those in need, no strings attached. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, our operations span uh, from Africa to the US uh, and, the, um, and the Bahamas. And uh, we have raised up to $450 million to deliver to the extreme poor since 2009. This year has been 
despite uh, a year of exponential growth, we managed to raise up to $190 million uh, to support mostly the vulnerable uh, in Africa, the U.S., and the Caribbean. Uh, our humanitarian work um, previously has focused on international development, uh, poverty reduction, but recently we've begun uh, working more in humanitarian crisis settings. Uh, and this work has involved uh, refugee, protracted refugee work, both in Kiradongo in Uganda and in Mogombo in Rwanda. Um, and also recently with the COVID pandemic, uh, we've done projects uh, responding to that uh, and to Hurricane Dorian in Bahamas, uh, Hurricane Harvey in the US and Hurricane uh, Maria in Puerto Rico. Um, and the reason why we do cash is because it is uh, impactful. Uh, there's evidence up to 165 research studies that show that the outcomes for cash are impactful uh, across a wide range of outcomes. Uh, two, cash is quite efficient. Uh, we had the program in the U.S. where 98% of the money we raised from the donors was able to be delivered in the hands uh, of the recipients in need. Um, and then it's also empowering. Uh, we need to think us about how to give in a dignified manner uh, and what better way than putting the resources in the hands uh, of the recipients so that they can make their own choices about uh, what their priorities are uh, when they're in extreme need. Um, so yeah, so basically in a nutshell, uh, that's what we're doing, that's the exciting work we're doing at Give Directly and all this has been made possible through partnership uh, with the MNOs because a big chunk uh, of this delivery is happening through mobile money. Wonderful, thank you, Ivan. Um, one thing again, I kind of forgot to mention how it's group is we'll try to limit our response, gentlemen, to at most one minute. So I'll be timing um, when we, as we progress, if you hear me coughing at the background, just know I'm giving you the signal that it's, it's time to move on. Uh, so moving on, um, a decade or so ago, when we used to hear about disaster has strike somewhere, what humanitarian organizations used to think about as part of the fundamental preparing to respond were three things. These were people, money, and things. People, the surge capacity to respond. Uh, money, there is, that's what they used to buy the resource, and things, these include both non-food items, like NFIs, food, and ETC. However, from around 2008, 2009, a fourth element starting to crop in. And this was technology, or let's just call it mobile-enabled technology, it covers the whole spectrum of digital. As we all know, humanitarian organization fundamental know-how is not to be tech company, not to be MNOs. They are the responder. They work directly with environmental communities. So they have to rely on building strong partnerships with the private sector, both mobile network operators as well as uh, other private sectors. So this question, next question, please try to time your answer. If you can do it within 30 seconds, that would be great. And it will go to all of you. Why do you partner? And why do your organization partner with humanitarian sector? What is it that is motivating the organization to partner? And this is specific, specifically from your perspective. So I'm going to start again with you. Why is it that ICONA decided to partner with humanitarian sector? So thank you very much uh, for that question. So um, just to answer you very briefly, uh, the under reason, underlying reason why we decided to partner uh, is as a model of doing business, first of all, that is more sustainable for us as, a, as an operator in that we want to leverage the strengths of the other players. So we come in very strong, very strong in terms of being able to apply technology to be able to you know, enhance the process. So I think that is the first reason, uh, just to make sure that we are sustainable in terms of what we want to do. Uh, the second, of course, uh, uh, we derive from the purpose for why we exist as a business. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, we want to, to, to improve the, the overall quality of life uh, by offering access 
to social and financial services through technology. So that again aligns to our revenue objectives that we have as a business, uh, really. So I think the two combined really give a solid reason why we choose to partner in humanitarian. Uh, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to move to you, Ivan. I know I had the pleasure of visiting Give Directly um, program operation at the last mile and extremely impressed. And I know Give Directly is one of the NGOs up there that builds strong partnership with the private sector, specifically in NOs. Why do you do that? Why does Give Directly do that from your perspective? No, thank you, Isaac. I think that's a very good question. Um, for us, um, MNOs are just the perfect partner uh, because uh, of their reach uh, and infrastructure uh, that covers the most hard to reach areas, uh, which is where we target, uh, where most of our operations uh, exist. Um, so by leveraging um, this existing infra from the MNOs, we are able to not only deliver uh, the resources to the most vulnerable in the difficult to reach places where ordinarily uh, the normal banking infrastructure uh, has not yet reached, uh, but also we are able to offer like a customer care service to these folks. Um, so not, and this does not stop just um, on, 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 on the infra. Uh, we are in sync in terms of how we think about innovation. We are highly innovative and uh, who better to partner with than a highly innovative partner. Uh, as we speak right now, we're doing some work in Uganda and Togo um, to respond to the COVID response using uh, uh, cell phone data um, of the network uh, of, 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 uh, of, of the MNOs that we're partnering with. Where ordinarily we could not find lists or it was hard to get physical contact with people, there are other creative and innovative ways in which we can use uh, their capabilities to, uh, to do uh, our targeting. Um, there's so many other things like we've integrated with their platforms and that gives us capabilities to be able to report to our donors and know real time that, you know, um, accounts real time uh, to the donors, like in terms of uh, the money reaching the wallet, the recipient. Uh, but, um, in a nutshell, uh, the, the perfect partner uh, to go with. Thank you. And uh, Jaffe, high level, why does Airtel partner with humanitarian organization from your perspective? Thank, thank you, Isaac. I know, I know many people would expect that um, revenue will be the first thing that we talk about when it comes to this kind of uh, equation. But um, I just want to share with you that uh, when we look at it uh, from Airtel perspective, we look at our customer. We don't look at it as, um, you know, when it comes to humanitarian, you look at it from uh, a beneficiary of uh, a social grant or something that uh, of that support, but we look at it from the customer perspective. And why do we think it works for us when we work with uh, humanitarian companies? So we want to connect with that customer. We want to provide them a connectivity to reach out to their friends, relatives, and anybody else who might uh, uh, be there to help. Then um, once you have connected them, we want also them to transact. Because as much as we think um, transactions are only available for the people who have financial muscle, the, these, these, uh, these beneficiaries also they need to learn how to transact in a safe and secure way. Because one of the things that you discover that uh, all the panelists here are try trying to provide when it comes to uh, mobile financial services or so mobile money services is to provide security and also to, 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 to provide accountability also. Because sometimes people are not able to account for, for their money. And it's only by doing these two things that you change their lives. Because if we don't, we don't impact the lives of these people that we are calling less fortunate or the bottom of the pyramid, then we don't, don't, do not have to exist. We exist to make changes and make changes that will impact people's lives. And this is one of the reasons why we found it very useful. And we find it very useful across all our 14 markets to connect with the um, humanitarian and provide this service to, the, to, our, to our customers. Thank you, Isaac. That's brilliant. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I had a follow-up question on that, but I'm going to take a pause on that specific follow-up question, but go to, to the 
the next question that was coming after that, it focuses on what we all as global community are currently going through. It strike us from early late last year and still ongoing. We cannot travel anymore. We, some countries have, have locked down major in places and so on and so forth. Mothers and dads had to become teachers, teaching the kids at, from home. We all have been through it. Um, did your organization, and this question goes to Wood and Jaffe, did your MNO respond to COVID pandemic in the country of, in your country of operation? If so, what sort of initiative did you put in place and how did this work? Let me start by you, Wood. All right, someone needs to mute on their end. Thank you. Yeah, so coming to your question, thank you, Ma thank you very much. Uh, so uh, upon uh, the onset of COVID uh, pandemic, I think as an operator in Burundi, uh, there are quite a number of initiatives that we've, uh, we've run, but maybe I'll try and highlight maybe uh, at high level, uh, the main ones that we've done. So starting from, uh, I think as a, as a communications uh, company, I think we played a very key role in terms of disseminating information uh, as far as uh, the COVID-19 uh, protocols are concerned. So we've really been able to partner with, again with the government and the health ministry for that matter uh, in terms of trying to disseminate information that is simple and, you know, uh, to a level that the common person is able to understand, simplify those, uh, you know, the protocol to a level that, you know, are really at a common man's uh, understanding level. So that is one of the things that we've done. Uh, but of course, I think a bigger thing that we are, we've done and continue to do is that uh, as cassava fintech business, uh, and this is not only domiciled in, uh, in the Burundi instance, but runs across, is that uh, we have uh, uh, a very uh, robust super app. Uh, and in that super app, we have an application that is uh, having a health status report whereby you are able to actually be able to uh, check your status and share, uh, you can run your own, own test and share your status, a status report about uh, the app. Uh, so maybe I may not be able to go into the nitty gritty of how it works, but I think it's uh, something that is really transformational and is actually coming to really uh, at a very uh, opportune time to be able to deliver uh, the assistance that we need or the interventions that we really need as an, you know, as a FinTech to be able to be of relevance at this particular time. Uh, of COVID-19 pandemic. So I think those are the two key areas in terms of dissemination of information, uh, the app that we're running in terms of the tests. But of course, uh, maybe as I end, uh, we've had uh, situations where the different human humanitarian actors within Burundi uh, are also pushing out uh, financial aid to the affected communities. So again, uh, we are also running programs uh, with number a number of them currently. And we continue to do that. So I think, in a in a brief way, uh, those are the three key areas of uh, uh, support or intervention that we are coming in as a cassava fintech Burundi. Uh, I think that responds to your question. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, same question to you, Jafet. Uh, but please keep it um, very short so that we can uh, be wrapping up soon. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Isaac. Uh, you, you know, you know, you if you tell me to keep it short, it's also a very challenging thing for me because we, I'll be talking about like 14 different operations for Africa. So basically, and every operation has done its own things during this period. One thing that I want just to to to, to share with the team uh, and even with the panelists is, um, you know, you know, they, this is a crisis that nobody expected, nobody was prepared. And um, it was also across everywhere. It was not, nobody could say I would pick it, the, the learnings from here or there. You know, I will share an example when the schools were shut down in Kenya, for example, where I stay, we thought it's for a week. Then it became months, and now it has become, uh, we, don't, we have no, no idea when the schools are going to, to open. And this, this is not only in Kenya, it's across all the market. But then, what, what, what was our major challenges because of during this crisis? People could not travel. Even our own employees could not move to the, some, in some areas we had lockdown. And we had to find a way of making sure that communication continues. 
And one of the challenges that we face would have been a bigger crisis is actually if people were not able to reach out to each other because families were, were, were actually uh, blocked from uh, engaging. Sometimes people could not see each other. Some people are in other countries. And um, one thing that I know we did very well as Airtel, and even today we continue to do very well, is to monitor that there is no uh, lack of airtime in the market. So we ensure that um, communication continues because any opportunity where we feel there is a, a challenge in getting airtime, we provide an alternative solution. The other part that we did, and this one I want also to commend the governments in most of our countries and the central banks, is um, we had actually to engage. And this is a constant engagement almost weekly to look at what are the challenges people are facing. And you'll discover that in quite a number of markets, we actually dropped the charging or we waived the, the fees for some transactions which were very basic, like money transfer. So we said that the customer not be charged any fee for money transfer in the market during this period. And then, since we wanted also to move more people to cash, because also cashless, sorry, because cash is also considered one of the ways of spreading the, the, the coronavirus, we had actually to take a position to say that for these uh, payments, such as over-the-counter merchant payments, in most of our markets, raise not charge them, because we want to encourage people to use electronic means of payment. When it comes to social humanitarian support, I can give you endless examples, but I know I don't have time. In every single country, we are partnered with uh, humanitarian companies and uh, mostly NGOs to make sure that we disburse money. I'll give you just one example where we have done uh, different um, uh, service from the norm. That was in, uh, in, uh, in um, uh, Congo, Brazzaville, Congo B, whereby we have hand to develop and use a special wallet where, which, which enables the money that is given by humanitarian organization, by the NGO, to be used in specific merchants where basic things could be found. The, the, this actually has taught us a different way of looking at this uh, kind of a challenge in future, because now we are going to look at it from, is it possible for us to develop specific solutions that will support humanitarian uh, initiatives? And, 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 and there's many examples I can give you from Uganda to Tanzania to Malawi to Zambia, where we are partnered with the uh, NGOs and uh, any uh, other organizations, including government, to facilitate the disbursement of the money. In conclusion, I want to say this thing. You know, for a long time, we have been building uh, agent network and ensuring that there is money, there is cash available in the market, but we never knew that it can be this useful. But this COVID has really taught us that we need actually to prepare for a disaster that can happen anytime and uh, can be global. And now it's becoming a norm. It's no longer the new, the, the new way of working is now completely. We work from home. Nobody is going to the market, but we have not been able to disrupt any of our services. Thank you, Isaac, for this opportunity. Many, many thanks. And I think we, that will be a wrap. We've gone through all the questions. Some questions were not necessarily asked specifically, but you did touch on them through your answers. So I'm not going to be taking much of your time. I would like to thank you all for making it to this session today. Um, we, last communication from us is please stay tuned to a series of blog series that we are currently compiling and uh, uh, publishing, highlighting industry response to COVID. 19 these some of them can already be found on the gsma website these highlight the key role that mnos played in the response to covid crisis so um ivan the, the first question will be addressed to you um in responding to covid 19 pandemic we've seen that mobile network operators have played a critical role and have been at the forefront of the response itself could you please tell us a little bit on how give directly as an organization uh, tapped into that potential, especially around um, vulnerable population targeting and the use, 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 usage of mobile data to uh, determine poverty index when doing um, cash distribution for social protection. Ivan. Thank you, uh, Isaac. Um, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, just like you said correctly, um, very good question. Um, initially, uh, we've been working with uh, MNOs, uh, particularly to 
use their network and their uh, uh, their infrastructure to deliver uh, cash to recipients. But what we've seen uh, as part of innovation, uh, especially with the COVID response, is we were not able to go out and physically meet people without uh, the pandemic, uh, without creating risk for our recipients and for our teams. So what we did is we worked with the MNOs and, uh, and government, uh, both in Togo uh, and in Uganda, to get a sign off uh, to use um, their data, recipient data, um, especially in the geographical areas where these vulnerable people were located. So based, depending on the transaction types and stuff like that, uh, we built an algorithm that could score uh, based on spending patterns uh, and isolate people who you could see that really uh, they're most vulnerable just by you know, uh, using an already existing database uh, of telco data. Um, and as a result, we've managed to have quite a sizable database of people that we can treat uh, that can address the budget. To give you an example, uh, we had raised about $16 million just for delivery uh, across the border and also Togo is opening up uh, for the same. Uh, so it's quite exciting, it's quite innovative, uh, allows us to be 100% contactless in terms of engagement and still be able to deliver uh, efficiently and effectively uh, to the recipients uh, that are uh, in need of uh, support. Thanks, Ivan. And um, one question for you, Wood, and it comes from uh, the, the, the participants. If MNOs are looking to partner with humanitarians or NGO for the first time, what would you say is the key things they should consider? Absolutely. Um, very good question, uh, as always. Um, uh, first, the benefit is me. Ivan, sorry. The question was for Wood. For... Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> that's all right. But that's okay. Let's give Wood that opportunity to answer. Thank you. Wood? Thank you, Mr. Ivan, for coming in very fast uh, on that one. Uh, but maybe if uh, Mr. Isaac, if I could, if you may, rather, uh, would you just reframe your question again? Is it? Uh, what who needs to consider what is the MNO or the NGO, please? If the MNO are looking to partner with um, humanitarian or NGO, yes. what should they consider? Okay, perfect. So, is on mute. Can't hear you, Wood. Please come. Sorry, and sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry about that. And All thanks. Right. So I think uh, just to respond to the question, uh, there's actually a number of uh, factors that come into play when you look at what we consider uh, when we want to partner with someone. I mean, with the the end, when the MNO needs to partner with uh, any of the humanitarian players uh, or actors for that matter. First of all, I think. Uh, from a business point of view, uh, we look at us being able to connect with anyone. This, we, are, we are actually uh, available to any, any you know, actor within the industry. Uh, but of course, there are limitations uh, that sometimes are beyond us. And when I talk the limitation, it is in terms of the network coverage, which is very critical. Uh, in the sense that you might find out, like, for example, the the players within the immigrations, um, the ones that handle the refugees, for example, you might realize that the refugee camps are set up in places where we hardly have coverage. Um, basically because there's no financial motivation or commercial uh, uh, justification uh, for network uh, to be available, to, uh, to be available at such places. So what happens again as a business is that uh, we've uh, put in place some uh, measures including sales on wheels, whereby when called upon in such situations, we are able to be flexible enough to be able to avail network uh, to such, uh, you know, um, demand areas. The other thing is, of course, uh, uh, specifically for Burundi, uh, there's a lot of sensitivity in terms of people that are coming into the country. It's a country that has been, you know, bedeviled with a lot of uh, uh, unrest um, in the recent past. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, attention to 
who is the, who it is that is coming to the country or leaving the country for that matter. But looking at this one, is you're looking at the people coming in, and you realize that uh, there are very strict uh, data capturing protocols that are put in place uh, by the government uh, to the extent that sometimes for us to be able to collect that information is almost impossible. So what happens is that again we. Uh, work with the government in very close collaboration, uh, collaboration uh, to the extent that some of the KYC requirements that may be uh, set up by the government, we are able to then uh, use circumvent or bend, for lack of a better word, uh, to be given some leeway, uh, be able to accommodate those particular kind of uh, you know uh, groups of people to be able to, to be registered on the network and ultimately to be able to benefit from our services. Uh, the other thing that also comes into play is also our network in terms of agent coverage. Remember, uh, the biggest thing that we do is being able to disperse money to them. Uh, and of course, uh, the need for us to have strong agents to be able to, you know, avail enough value, uh, even in the deepest of the remote of the places, it is a very critical consideration that we need to have. So uh, again, um, not to say that we never had challenges in that, uh, but of course what happens uh, is uh, we have two models, whereby first of all we start off with mobile agents that we carry, transport those uh, locations, where, what, whatever time, uh, when, as, when need required to, we carry them to those locations that they're able to, you know, to dispense the, the, to disperse the money. Uh, the other model is whereby over time now we start to build capacity, to build uh, footprint. footprint. Um, uh, in the long term, so that as we continue now, we don't have to carry mobile agents to those places, but develop agents within those uh, local communities that we are operating in. Uh, so I think it is a, a whole list of uh, smaller factors that I would look at in terms of what it is as a consideration. But maybe to, to, to before I come to the end, uh, there's also the element of due diligence. Uh, because again, for any player or any partner that you need to go into partnership with, then uh, we need to provide the uh, clear, uh, uh, to be very clear in terms of their um, their validity or their authorization to be operating within Burundi. For instance. So we do thorough check in terms of uh, due diligence, uh, and once that has been asserted to be okay. Uh, then we just start off the process, uh, sign off an NDA, and then we need to integrate all that, all that begins, and then until we are able now to do the payment. So basically, uh, I'll say those are the key, the key uh, areas that we really look at in terms of uh, who is able to partner with us. And once those have been ticked as, those boxes have been ticked as okay, uh, then we are ready to go. But not to say that we are ready that we cannot be able, we try to be as flexible as we can be. We try to be as agile as can get just to make sure that we accommodate. Because sometimes these are the requests, most of the requests that come in they are really unique in different ways. So we right. really try to be accommodative of the needs that come to us. So right. I think that is what I would respond for, I mean, to in terms of uh, the question that you asked. And thank you much. Many thanks, Wood. Um, and Ivan, for being available to attend um, the session today. Many thanks for all our participants that have been able to join us remotely, and to Zoe, my colleague Zoe, and Belinda for uh, making this also possible, and everyone else who supported us behind the scene. We now come to an end of our session. I uh, would like to acknowledge the support uh, for this program that come to um, KFZTO, as well as uh, the support we receive for, from our members, uh, that is JCMS members. I uh, thank you for all the support for making this possible. Thank you all and have a lovely day. Thank you.